Hello everyone, um, I'm here to present to you a paper entitled Providence and Perfection in the case of person with profound intellectual disability. Um, this is one of the uh, topics that is not very um, often uh, discussed in audioxiology and I hope um, you will look at this paper as an exploratory one, precisely because it is among the, the very few discussing this topic. In one of the most seminal books in the field of disability theology, Receiving the Gift of Friendship, Profound Disability, Theological Anthropology and Ethics, Dutch theologian Hans Reindeers criticized Western Christian tradition for its lack of concern for persons with profound intellectual disability. The critique was directed mainly towards Roman Catholicism, whom he said doesn't allow for the recognition of persons with profound intellectual disabilities as full human beings. Reinders claimed that although Roman Catholic theology considers all human beings equal because they are born from human parents, Roman Catholic theology doesn't, however, think that some human being does think, however, that some human beings are better than others because perfection can be attained only through the exercise of certain qualities such as discernment and will. He called this orientation of Roman Catholic ethics teleological and he explains it using the analogy of an apple. I quote, if you look at it from the question of origin, you will see that the eventual imperfection of a member of a natural kind doesn't annihilate its being a member of this kind. True, but the problem posed here arises not because of the question of origin, but because of the question of telos. To stick to the above example, surely the bad apple is an apple from the perspective of origin but from the perspective of its final end, it is not an apple whose being carries any value. It doesn't count for much. It will be trashed if someone bothers to pick it up at all. This critique was rejected by two Roman Catholic theologians in two different ways. For Miguel Romero, Reindeers misunderstood Aquinas in the Catholic tradition. It is true that the account of the telos or the perfection of the human being is important in Catholic ethics, but the attainment of this telos is not limited to the exercise of certain capacities. A person with profound intellectual disability can very well be perfected through the sanctifying grace she receives through the sacrament. In such cases, grace works without the cooperation of the person. The other respondent was Peter Comansoli, who wrote an entire book dedicated to fighting Reinders claim. In his book, Comansoli criticized Reinders on several points. The most important critique being that the Catholic tradition doesn't speak of a hierarchy of being based on human capacities. It is true, Comansoli agrees, that being in the image of God is a good in itself, uh, and the likeness or living according to the image is the biggest good of human life. But persons with intellectual disability have the advantage of not being able to choose. In this way, Common Soli claims, they live according to their nature and enjoy the good of their nature. Hence, persons with profound intellectual disabilities are much more probable to live a life according to their nature than the rest of human beings. While I'm sympathetic to Romero and Comensoli's responses, I think that Reinders' critique still stands at the end of the day. Romero is convincing in his reconstruction of Aquinas' thought, but what he doesn't manage to do, at least for me, it is to explain how persons with profound intellectual disabilities who are outside the church are going to attain perfection without sacramental grace. From Nordok's perspective, this is a fundamental question because according to Basil the Great, all humans are called to perfection or deification. If some would be unable to express their desire to be in the church and receive the sacraments, they would be somehow left outside this goal of perfection. Comensoli's argument solved this issue, but raises many more. One can agree in principle with the idea that a natural life is one where one doesn't have to choose between good and bad, and consequently persons with profound intellectual disabilities live a life that is closer to, Truman, to human nature. But then, one has to ask at least two questions. First, if identifying intellectual disability with perfection is not patronizing, and second, why would God choose to create someone closer to perfection than others? 
Does this entail some form of election where persons with profound intellectual disabilities are chosen by God to be holy without any link with their actions in this world? Turning to our theology, one soon realizes that we're facing the same difficulty as Comensoli and Romero. Much of the literature on perfection is fo focused on cognitive capacities such as contemplation or will. We could, of course, follow Romero's path by adapting this argument to the theology of John Zizulas. But even so, Zizulas' anthropology wouldn't speak about those outside the church. Similarly, even if as Orthodox we are not comfortable speaking about natural law, we could still uh, follow Comensoli's path uh, in reference to Berdyayev, who expresses a similar idea, namely that human choice is a consequence of the fall. But then again, we do not actually solve any of the issues related to common solis position. So what I would like to do further is to lay out a framework for rethinking perfection in a way that includes persons with profound intellectual disabilities while avoiding the above mentioned pitfalls. The hypothesis I wish to advance is that perfection is not a process that involves human agency, but an event. Perfection is attained in the moment when God reveals God's self through a person for the spiritual benefit of others in order to move the world closer to its goal of deification. To flesh out this vision, I will combine the theological insight of Dimitris Staniloi, an Orthodox theologian, and Hansus von Balthasar, a Roman Catholic. This doesn't mean that either Staniloi or Balthasar would subscribe to my definition of perfection, nor that, to my knowledge, they mentioned persons with profound intellectual disabilities in their works. What I endeavor to do here is a constructive engagement with their theologies, which to a certain extent is similar to their own approach to the tradition of the church. I will begin by explaining that for Staniloi, God takes the world towards deification through God's revelation in history. Every social or political event, every encounter in human life, has the potential of revealing God's will for the individual and the human race, pushing them closer towards this catological fulfillment. Then, I'll move to explain that on a personal level, perfection means being transparent to this revelation of God in history. To develop this point, I will use von Balthasar's metaphor of the world as a drama. For Balthasar, all human beings have a role to play in the drama of salvation, when they play their role correctly, they become transparent to Christ for the entire world to see. Finally, I'll return to explain how one could attain perfection and be transparent to God without necessarily being conscious of it. For this, I'll use St. Louis' notion of the knowledge of God in the concrete, in concrete situations. The premise of my argument is that God takes the world towards deification through his revelation in human history. I take this premise from the work of uh, Romanian theologian Dimitri Staniloi, who claims that God is constantly calling the human beings to advance in the love of Christ and the Trinity. This call takes place through history, whether we talk about a historical event, an apparently random encounter with a stranger, or a technological breakthrough. All these experiences are words of God, meant to guide a human being toward spiritual growth and through her growth to bring the world closer to union with God. For St. Louis, the world was created in order to become a divine human communion mediated by the materiality of creation. Following Maximus the Confessor, St. Louis argues that each created being was designed with an internal rationality that finds its meaning and fulfillment outside itself in relation to the Logos of God. To use a contemporary metaphor, each being represents a piece of a Lego game with its own shape and separate existence, but this piece fulfills its proper function only as part of the bigger construction from which it was designed. This construction, let's say uh, hypothetically the heavenly Jerusalem, is realized at the end of time when all these building blocks of creation are brought together in the place destined for them in the in unity with the Logos of God. This motion towards the construction of the heavenly Jerusalem takes place to history under God's divine providence. St. Louis sees historical events as ways meant to take the creation closer to its eschatological fulfillment. For example, and this might, uh, might be shocking for some, St. Louis interprets the Great Depression of the 1930s as the work of God in human history 
a work uh, the work of blood meant to push the world towards greater solidarity. I quote, never has manifested so obviously in human consciousness that the fate of all is one, that good and evil are not good and evil just for the individual, but for all. Selway speaks in similar terms about the ecological crisis. God has put, has put boundaries to the, to the earth, there is a, our uh, natural resources are limited in order to make the human race understand that creation is meant for sharing and communal life. The more acute the ecological crisis, the more aware we become of the need for global solidarity. Every occurrence in human history is a revelation of God's plan for the world that rearranges the building blocks of creation in their eschatological form. However, Stanislaw doesn't limit God's providential activity in the world at macro level. God reveal his, reveals his will for each person to the events taking place in her life. Every encounter one has with others, every dialogue or every experience of creation can carry, God, can carry God's message for us, attempting to attune us to God's plan for the world. Or, to put it differently, each human being is called to personal perfection and his or her perfection will help God lead the world to its fulfillment. This view finds expression in Stanley's concept of the knowledge of God in concrete situations. In his most celebrated work, The Experience of God, Stanley speaks about three types of, of knowledge, cataphatic, apophatic, and through everyday experiences. The cataphatic knowledge this teaches us that God is the cause and the support of the world. The apophatic knowledge is based on the experience of God's uh, mystical presence in the world. They both sustain and complement each other rather than being in opposition. The experience of God in concrete situations is something different. It is neither conceptual nor experiential as such. It is the realization that God is only speaking to us through the various events taking place in our lives. Some of these experiences might be traumatizing, for example, various types of losses, while others might be more mundane, overhearing a conversation on the bus, for instance. Yet, they all can have a hidden spiritual significance that could take, take us a step closer to fulfilling God's plan for us and the deification of creation. I quote again uh, from Stanley Lai. Everyone knows God to the appeal that he makes to him, placing the person in various circumstances and in contact with various people who demand that he fulfills certain duties and who test his patience in difficult ways. Everyone knows God in the qualms of conscience. He f uh, in the qualms of conscience, he feels for the wrong he has committed. And finally, everyone knows him in his own troubles and failures temporary or lasting, in his own illness, or that of those close to him that results from certain evils done or as means of moral perfection and spiritual strengthening. But everyone but um, everyone also know God in the deep, in the help that you receive from him in overcoming these and all the other barriers and difficulties that stand in this way. This knowledge helps in leading each man on his way, on his own way of perfection. Um, now, I'm aware that listening to this quote, you would think uh, that I haven't mentioned anything about persons with profound intellectual disabilities so far, and that I'm still working with the same framework of perfection seen as a free and continuous progress in the life of the believers. What I wanted to do here, however, was only to establish that the purpose of God's revelation in the world is to move it closer to becoming a human divine communion. To achieve this goal, God works through individuals who are shepherded in the right direction to his discrete intervention in their lives. In the following section, I'll argue that the moment when someone becomes a vessel of God's revelation for another person, she has attained her perfection. To unfold this statement, I'll refer to the metaphor of human history as a theodrama developed, as developed by the Swiss theologian Hansus von Balthasar. To understand the movement of history towards God throughout the centuries, von Balzar uses the metaphor of the world as a piece of theater where each person has a certain role to play, no matter how small or mundane that role may appear. In his eternal wisdom, God has established for each human being a specific character with a series of distinctive features, bodily, mental, or even social. 
Balthazar distinguishes between four masks or persona that constitutes the human self. I quote, first, there is human nature in general, the source of ethical worth for each individual. Secondly, there is the particular nature that is allotted to him by his personal physical constitution, which everyone may legitimately develop, provided that, in doing so, he keeps within the limits of human nature as a whole. He should never attempt to imitate anyone else's nature, forgetting his own, but rather should make sure that everything harmonizes with his own distinctive quality. The third persona is whatever we have acquired through chance and external circumstances. And the fourth, and this is the most important, is what we make of ourselves by our own decisions. It is our own will that decides the role we personally wish to play in life. These features have simultaneously a negative and a positive connotation. The negative aspect is that they represent the limitation of our own I. Certain physical features or social circumstances will enable some people to act differently than others. Some might be born with a certain beauty, uh, beauty others in rags, others can be born in wealthy families, while others might have a physical disability. Yet, what matters for bouts are in such a situation is to, is to accept them as they are, as our own limitations, because only in this way one can actually play his role in the drama of salvation. The positive aspect of seeing the human life as a role in a play where all characteristics are already assigned is that they do not mean anything in themselves. They reveal their meaning only in the context of the play, in the interaction between the characters, when the human beings decide how to use their freedom. To quote again Balthazar, only the action itself will reveal how each individual is, and it will not reveal, through successive unveilings, primarily who the individual always was, but rather who he is to become through the actions, through his encounter with others, and through the decisions he makes. The way in which the human beings interpret, um, interpret these features in interaction with other people can lead to a poor or brilliant performance. Balzar argues that what differentiates a good actor from a bad one is the extent to which they are able to assume the role and find the fulfillment of their self in it. Wholehearted effort is called for to play one's role, one's role well from beginning to end, aware that the two I, the, that the two, the I and the role do not coincide, which is why an inferior role in no way harms the dignity of the actor. All the same I doesn't stand untouched behind the wall. All, all, <clears throat> all the same, the I doesn't stand untouched behind the role. It acts out its own destiny in the role. It is in the role that it provides itself or fails to. This is where it freely acquires or fails to acquire its own shape. Now, when the role is played well, the human being becomes a transparent medium for Christ's presence in the world. Like St. Louis, Balzar is also logocentric. Since everything was created in, through, and for Christ, it means that all roles are linked in a way or another with Christ. Thus, when interpreted virtuously, the actor becomes transparent to Christ's light. Or, to put this in a metaphor closer to orthodox imagery, the human being is like a painter of icons who finds out that the most of the rules have been set long before she started to paint. The only way to manifest her creativity and freedom remains to express herself through those rules. In a sense, the human being becomes a genuine work of art only if she uses her capacities in the way God intended them. Perfection is attained when God's will for the human being and her will are attuned, thus making transparent the presence of God in that icon. The first reason uh, I find, uh, for which I find Balthazar's vision compelling is that although he speaks about a long process of attunement between human and divine will, a process which is fully conscious and manifested through mastery over one's body, he leaves the door open for the interpretation of perfection as an event. The metaphor of the drama shows that the interpretation of the role is momentary, unique, and unrepeatable. As Baldar himself explain, explains, an actor can play to perfection the role she was designed only once. The second or the third performances are never going to be the same. They will never reach the same intensity. I quote again Balzar, in its premiere, the play enters into, a time, into time as an event. It is so much an event indeed that the Greeks mostly eschewed repeat performances. Historical events are unique. 
Other forms of art might gradually come to life and attain perfection, but only on-stage perfection is a fleeting instant, never to be fully grasped, never to be fully repeated. What this means uh, in this context is that the fulfillment of the allotted role can take place in a temporal frame, an hour, a month, several years, but not more. To paraphrase Saint Louis, it might be the conversation over her in the bus that changed my life. And for this conversation, for this role, God has prepared that person for a long time together with the circumstances. Thus, the moment of perfection of, of a person might last for months or several years, could last months or several years, but it cannot be something we, we can hold on until the ends of our lives. This leads to the second reason for which I like Balzar's metaphor of, um, of the drama. Because, despite him saying the opposite, the metaphor itself doesn't necessarily entail one being conscious of her role. As in the above example, God can reveal God's intention for a person through someone else's without that person being aware of this. And now, even if we would, would continue in the Balthazarian spirit, this happens quite often in certain in certain plays in certain uh, authors it's not always that the um, the characters intend to play the role properly but um it's always that they make a, a at a certain point they make a mistake and that mistake leads to something else it's kind of the same idea but to return to the above example of the person speaking in the bus about her problems um some that person could be an atheist with no interest no interest in faith but somehow his word might help me change my relationship with christ and in this way encourage me to push the world closer to deification similarly a person with profound intellectual disability might be in the same situation namely to attain perfection by revealing god's will to others without necessarily realizing it for instance, Henry Newton was a professor of theology at Harvard when he met Jean Vanier, the founder of large communities, where persons with and without learning disabilities live and share life together. Vanier invited no, no one to experience large. No one went and was asked to take care of Adam, um, a person with profound intellectual disabilities. At first, no one was very uncomfortable in helping Adam and always concerned that Adam might get hurt. When I talked with him, I had to get behind him and support him with my body and my arms. This is what no one said. I worried constantly that he would trip on my feet, fall and hurt himself. I was also conscious that he could have a grand seizure at any moment, sitting in the bathtub, on the toilet, eating his breakfast, resting, walking or being shaved. After some time, however, now I started to realize that Adam was becoming his teacher. The tables were turning. Adam was my teacher taking me by the hand, walking with me in my confusion through the wilderness of my life. Among the many things that Adam taught no one were to see the beauty of ordinary life, to understand that what he was looking for was, uh, was love, friendship, community, and a deep sense of belonging. It seems to me that this example fits very nicely the point I'm trying to make. To Adam, God reveals a message for improving no one's life, no, his experiences, his books, end up changing the lives of other disabled persons and the perception of the community towards persons with profound intellectual disabilities. This moment when Adam has taught no one to see life differently is the moment when Adam attained his perfection by fulfilling his role in the drama of salvation and, I dare say, changing the lives of other persons with profound intellectual disabilities and through this taking the world closer to the realization of a human, of a human divine communion. To conclude, what I wanted to do in this paper was to show that human perfection means fulfilling one role in the drama of creation. The content of this role is to reveal God for the benefit of others and in this way to move the world closer to its eschatological form. Unlike Balthazar, for whom this revelation of God requires an act of volition from human part, Selai presents a view according to which intentionality is not required. God can be revealed to us through persons that might not wish to do so or might not be aware that they are carrying his message. This view enables us to make a more compelling case for the perfection of persons with profound intellectual disabilities. The example I used shows how Stanislaw's vision plays out. Adam has fulfilled his role of leading the world to deification even without being conscious of it. Now I am aware, I have to confess, that 
My argument has many loose ends and probably it raises more questions than it answers. I do not pretend um, that my solution for taking for talking about perfections uh, for talking about the perfections of persons with profound uh, disabilities is the best one, nor that there are not other alternatives. There are always other ways and resources in the tradition of the church and God's revelation are like the waters of a river, always flowing, always fresh. However, it is the nature of this field of inquiry, theological disability, and of this project to base themselves on uncharted territory. And it is my intention to, pen to pencil down a quick map that might be helpful for the next cartographer. So I'd like to ask you to eval evaluate this paper for its explor exploratory potential, and I'd be grateful for any suggestions you might have on how to improve it. Thank you very much.